So, Dr. Dharma one. Can you hear me? Yep. I can Left. hear you. Oh, you can't? Uh, yeah, I can I can hear you. It's, yeah, it's, uh, you you break up a little bit in the beginning, but now it's it's okay. 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 Uh -huh. uh, so let's go again. Uh, uh, Dr. Darmowen completed his PhD at the University of Sydney with Stephen Bartlett. Following that, he held two postdoctoral positions at the University of Sherbrooke with Dave Poulan and Tokyo University with Masatoshi Mata. Subsequently, he became an assistant professor at the Yukawa Institute for Theoretical Physics. Currently, he is working at Xanadu as a contractor on linear optical quantum error correction. His research interests also include measuring based quantum computing, quantum error correction, and high temperature superconductivity. Let's all welcome our speaker. Okay, thank you very much, Leandro, for the introduction. Um, by the way, please let me know if. Um, yeah, please like interrupt me at any point if uh, there's something you don't understand or you like clarified. Um, so, yeah, as mentioned, my name's Andrew Damawan. I'm usually I'm sort of affiliated with the UCAL Institute for Theoretical Physics, but right now I'm I'm having a bit of a, a break from that, and I'm working for a startup in in Canada called Xanadu, and. Um, so I'm very happy that uh, you've invited me to talk about um, our latest paper um, on which we put on the archive in, in December on um, uh, using random Clifford unitaries to do uh, quantum coding. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not assuming that everyone's an expert on error correction. I know you, you have some experts there. But uh, I won't go into too much details, hopefully. And uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Okay, so as you know, um, quantum computers are kind of a hot topic at the moment. Uh, there are many groups around the world trying to build um, quantum computers. Here are a couple of examples, like we have IBM's Eagle on the left and Google Sycamore processor on the right. Um, and uh, the promise is that these quantum computers eventually will be able to solve practical problems that we can't solve with conventional computers. Um, to, this, to do this, we, it seems like we'll have to scale up these quantum computers. And um, this is quite challenging in large part because um, all of these devices are very noisy. So you can imagine that if you have a noisy device, um, the computation like um, is going to become less and less reliable as you increase the system size, unless you do something to overcome noise, this, the errors. Fortunately, um, there are ways to do that. And, um, well, the main way to, that, that is proposed that people are working on is to use quantum error correction. So the basic idea of quantum error correction is that you protect your logical qubits, your um, the qubits that you use for the computation by encoding each logical qubit into the collective state of a large number of physical qubits in, in such a way that the noise can't directly uh, affect that logical information. Um, and actually, uh, recently quite a lot of experimental progress has been made in, in uh, the area of realizing quantum error correcting codes. Um, so for instance, Google has this had a recent experiment last year looking at a distance five um, surface codes. So certainly some basic experimental uh, demonstrations of quantum error correction are being done. However, there are still a lot of challenges and we, we still have a lot of work to do before these are um, practical. Um, so one of the big challenges um, when we think about scaling up quantum error correction especially using these surface code schemes is the overhead. Um, so 
for, for the surface code, for example, um, it's expected that if we wanted to do, you know, practical computations, we might need to have thousands of physical qubits for each encoded logical qubit. So you have this huge uh, experiment, this huge overhead um, that we, we need to, to with, with these um, error correcting schemes um, that we need to think about. So a lot of people are considering alternative schemes um, to, to the surface code and other topological codes uh, that have lower overhead. I mean, the surface code does have many uh, practical advantages. You can implement it in 2D um, with nearest neighbor interactions and it has a high threshold, uh, but the overhead is um, still quite a, quite a challenge. So there are these other schemes people are considering. Um, like what we would ideally want is something as an error correcting code that has a high rate. And, and um, when I say a high rate, what I mean is that um, the ratio of the number of qubits K to the number of physical qubits N is, um, is, is as large as possible. Um, ideally, we, we would want it to be asymptotically uh, a constant. Uh, for the surface code, it, it tends to zero. Um, and so uh, a promising direction of research, um, looking at these uh, low overhead uh, error correcting schemes is with these so-called low density parity check codes, LDPC codes. Um, so the, the idea of a low density parity check code is that, well, well, the definition is that each each check that you, each measurement check of the code acts on some bounded number of qubits, and each qubit is only involved in some bounded number of of checks. And um, so, a lot of uh, exciting research has been done uh, on LDPC codes in in recent years. So, I'm not going to be talking about that approach in this talk, I'll be talking about an alternative approach um, based on random codes. Um, so it doesn't have all of the nice properties um, of LDPC codes. It doesn't, um, for instance, it's not LDPC. You have checks that grow slowly with the system size, uh, but it does have some other nice properties. Um, so I guess, yeah, so in, in comparison to, you know, those these other constructions people are considering with LDPC codes, um, it's not not a very complicated construction at all. At least conceptually, it's what, I, what I'm going to talk about is a very simple way of encoding information where you all you do is you have a one dimensional chain and you run a short circuit, uh, a lo low depth random circuit. And um, you know what's what are the error correcting properties of, of this encoding scheme? And the main message is that what we find is that um, 1D log depth Clifford encoding circuits can achieve a high rate uh, against Pali noise. So I'll explain a little bit more um, about uh, yeah, what, elaborate on the, the, what what this means in the coming slides. Okay. So the basic picture of error correction that we're going to consider is uh, as I pictured here. So the idea is that we have some physical noise process that we want to protect against. And um, we have K, K logical qubits that we, we want to protect. So the idea is that um, we want to design some, enco some encoding map such that is that maps these k logical qubits into n physical qubits, some where n is is in general larger than than k. Um, in such a way that when you send those n physical qubits through the noise, um, you can catch them on the other side and rec and using some decoding procedure, uh, you can recover the original. Ide ideally recover the original 
uh, qubits that you, you you sent through in the beginning, the, the logical qubits that you wanted to protect. Um, oops. Uh, so uh, I, I should emphasize that this is a slightly simplified version of error correction in, in that we assume that the encoding and decoding procedures are done in a noiseless way and the noise only appears in in kind of in the middle of them in general encoding and and decoding will be themselves noisy noisy but this picture is at least uh, a useful um, first step for analyzing an error correction procedure um, so what we want is that the error rate on the output qubits is as low as possible and we also want that the the rate that is the the ratio of encoded uh, logical qubits to physical qubits is as high as possible. So we want to encode as, as um, so we want to have as low overhead as possible with as low error probability as possible. So we would, wa we would want in particular as n goes to infinity, the logical error rate to 10 to zero. And ideally with some good uh, encoding rate. Um, so just in terms of terminology, we say that um, given a noise map, the capacity of that noise oops, is, the, uh, is the, the highest rate that you can achieve with logical error rate going to zero um, as n goes to infinity. Yeah, optimizing over all possible encoding and decoding maps. Okay, so the type of noise that we're going to mainly consider is um, IID Pali noise. So where each qubit suffers uh, from an X Pali, X, Y, or Z error with uh, some probability. And we're mainly going to be consider the, consider the case where the probability of X, Y, and Z errors is uh, is equal. This is called depolarizing noise. Okay, so one way, so we're going to consider the case where the encoding is done with a, a unitary operator. So in this case you have your the logical qubits that you want to protect and you along with them you insert a bunch of check qubits, n minus k check qubits, um, initialized in the zero state. And then your encoding unitary acts on this whole system and outputs your um, encoded uh, information. So that this encodes your k qubits into your k logical qubits into the n physical qubits. Um, so one thing we can define using this encoding unitary oops, is um, checks. So we define the code checks as basically the um, Z operators on these check qubits conjugated by U. And uh, by definition, the output of this circuit is going to always be in the plus one eigenspace of um, all of these check operators. And these check operators are what we measure to detect errors. Um, so the stabilizer of, of the, the code, which is the, oh, sorry, <laughs> output of, of this circuit is uh, defined as the group generated by the checks. And by definition, the stabilizer is going to act um, as basically as the identity or trivially on um, states in the code space. Um, and so we can also define logical operators, um, which are the logic, which are single qubit X and Z operators uh, conjugate on the logical qubits conjugated by the encoding unitary. Um, and one, one point I should make is that we are mainly considering, well, we, we will only consider Clifford encoding unit, so a Clifford circuit. 
Clifford circuit maps um, Pali operators to Pali operators under conjugation. And so this, this ensures that all of the checks and all, all of the logical operators are um, themselves Pali operators. Um, so do we have any questions so far? Oh. I may occasionally just um, check check the, the Teams window because you know otherwise I have have no indication that you know I, I'm even still still connected. Um, yeah, it's very clear. Thank you. Up to now, it's okay. Uh, crystal clear. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so one thing that is has been known um, since almost since error correction, quantum error correction was invented, is that um, if you do the encoding with a random Clifford unitary, uh, you can achieve um, a certain the, the so-called hashing bound against independent ident uh, IID Pali noise. So the hashing bound is a is a relationship between um, the rate uh, of the code and the entropy, essentially the entropy of the noise. So, I mean, you can think of it um, either in terms of, well, if I have a certain rate um, and I use a, a random Clifford unitary for encoding, you know, what's the maximum, oops, what's the max, oh, sorry maximum uh, noise entropy I can I can uh, tolerate or I can think about it the other way and, and think about oh given a certain noise entropy what's the maximum rate I can achieve um, so this 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 uh, bound can be achieved using um, random Clifford unitaries so a random Clifford unitary basically doesn't have any notion of locality um, you would, well, if you were to implement it with, say, a circuit, you would either use non-local gates or, or something with a high depth. So it's not really regarded as so practical. And also, it's, there's no, no known way to do uh, efficient decoding. So that is to recover the information um, once, uh, I mean, there's no efficient way to recover the information once it's uh, passed through the noise channel. Um, so people have been considering perhaps more uh, practical ways of doing random encoding. Um, there's this famous result by Brown and Fazi, which showed that um, you can basically achieve the same performance um, with uh, the same performance as doing random Clifford encoding using only a Clifford circuit of uh, log cubed depth. Um, uh, again, there are some, I mean, it's an interesting result, but from a practical point of view, there are still some shortcomings. Again, it requires all-to-all -all connectivity and um, there's no efficient uh, decoding method for this scheme as well. So more recently, there was a result by Gullens and, and collaborators, which showed that, um, uh, yeah, so even if we restrict to a one-dimensional connectivity with only nearest neighbor interactions <laughs> and um, an encoding Clifford circuit of log depth, uh, you, see, you can get uh, a non-zero rate. In fact, you can achieve the capacity against a type of noise model called erasure noise. Um, so, so this gives us, uh, this suggests that these, um, yeah, even when we have a very restricted random circuit, restricted to 1D, uh, we can get uh, some, some good performance. Um, but I mean, the the limitation of this is that it their result applies to only this erasure noise model. So erasure noise basically assumes that we know the locations of all of the errors. Um, so this is information that information is available to the decoder. 
uh, in practice, uh, errors will occur and they don't tell us um, where they uh, where they are, you know, and it's up to the decoder to kind of deduce where the errors are. So, um, and one thing I should point out is that when you assume this erasure noise model, uh, the decoding problem becomes basically very trivial. You can decode almost, you can decode any stabilizer code in essentially the same way using some basic linear algebra. So this this study by Glanz, well, yeah, it, it definitely is interesting that it shows these restricted random circuits are good for encoding. Um, but um, we would like to consider the more realistic case where we don't uh, we, where we don't know the locations of errors. And this is essentially what our work is. So we consider the performance of um, essentially low depth Clifford circuits or log depth Clifford circuits embedded in one dimension under a Pali noise model. So a noise model where we don't know the error locations. And uh, what we find is that the achievable rate for, for such circuits, such encoding is actually very, I mean, this is a numerical study, but we find it's very close to the the hashing bound for depolarizing noise for a variety of noise strengths. So this is what I've plotted here. Oops, the dark black line is the, uh, the hashing bound. Um, and these dot red dots are what we uh, achieve from our simulations of this of these 1D log depth encoding circuits. And that dotted line is the uh, the capacity of the, the uh, sorry an, an upper bound on the capacity of the depolarizing channel. Um, so the main ingredient that we use to perform this analysis is that we develop we show that there exists an efficient tensor network decoder um, for uh, this type of encoding circuit. Um, okay. All right, so to be a bit more explicit about what I mean by a 1D uh, random Clifford encoding circuit, um, basically we imagine when we start, we have uh, our logical qubits um, spaced out e uh, e evenly among the check qubits like shown. And then we apply some, uh, some uh, Clifford unitaries in a kind of brickwork structure. So these two qubit gates are I swap gates. Um, and between every layer of I swap gates, we, we include, we um, insert random single qubit unitaries. So the randomness comes from these single qubit unitaries. Um, so actually we considered two types of uh, random circuits which have this structure. One of them is where we we sample the the um, the round the single qubit unitaries uniformly at random, and in another one we considered the case where um, we kind of we can ch we choose those single qubit unitaries um, to maximize the weight of the checks in the next layer, and if if uh, two if if there are two or more um, single qubit unitaries that lead to the same weight, then we uh, choose randomly among them. So the idea of maximizing the check weight is that we expect that if you if you have a higher weight check, then um, you can get more information about the noise that occurs and you get higher performance. And this is indeed what we observe from our simulations. Okay, okay so maybe I'll just stop for a moment. Are there any questions? Okay. Okay, so that's our encoding circuit. Now, how do we do the decoding? So um, the first step is what we typically do for stabilizer codes. Basically, we measure all of the checks. So as I mentioned, um, if the checks, if we're, if we don't have any noise and we're in the code space, then the checks should all return a plus one outcome. 
but if there are errors or noise, some of them will get, give return a minus outcome, and this gives, gives us like a hint about where the errors occurred. And then using that, that those outcomes, which we call the syndrome, we input that into a classical decoding algorithm uh, to determine the best way to correct the error. And uh, uh, this is where the tensor networks come in. So it's in this classical decoding step. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how familiar people are with tensor networks, but I figured it might be worth just telling you a little bit about the basics. Um, so, so basically a tensor network is, you can think of it as kind of Lego building blocks for describing uh, quantum objects. Things like quantum wave functions of many particles can be decomposed into these uh, tensor networks. So um, a tensor basically is a multi-index array of complex, complex numbers. So we have, um, so if you, if, you were to, if you draw a tensor, um, if you want to consider an array of, of, with four indices like this, you draw a, a, whoops, a, a node with four outgoing edges each edge corresponding to an index of that tensor. And the basic operation that you can perform on tensors is contraction. So if you have two tensors and you bring them together and join them by an edge like this, what that means is that you're summing over that contracted index. So in a way, you can think of it as a generalization of matrix multiplication. So matrix multiplication, if we were to draw it as a tensor network, looks like this. You have just have two, two index tensors and you connect them together uh, by an edge like that. Correspond, that. And that corresponds to summing over the contracted index. Um, but you can of course define much more complicated contractions. So one example would be like something in a square like this where you're summing over um, all of these indices that are connecting these tensors in a, in a square. Um, and the, the nice thing about tensor networks is that we can often use them to describe, to provide much more efficient representations of quantum states. So for instance, um, matrix product states. So a general quantum state you can write as, as like, as this, where you have this coefficient tensor, which has N indices it has an exponential number of terms. Um, so for certain types of states which have a low amount of entanglement, you can decompose this coefficient tensor into smaller tensors like this. So this one dimensional structure is called uh, a matrix product state. And um, these are extensively used in condensed matter physics and other fields to do numerical calculations. So personally, I'm quite interested in the applications of tensor networks to quantum error correction. And I think there are many uh, unexplored areas in, thing, in terms of things like simulation um, and decoding, which I, I'm going to talk about in a moment, and also uh, things like constructing. So, I mean, a very famous example of how you can use tensor networks in error correction is um, this happy code, how you, you, you can use a tensor network to define an error correcting code, which has interesting properties. Um, yeah, so if anyone's interested in talking more about how we can apply tensor networks in error correction, I, I'd be very happy to. Okay, so now back to the, um, the problem. So we're thinking about how we can decode, do decoding of these um, low depth uh, these codes defined by low depth random circuits in one dimension. And um, we can do it with tensor networks. Uh, we can do a type of decoding called maximum likelihood decoding. And the, I mean, the idea of maximum likelihood decoding is that we determine the correction that is most likely to correct the error given the syndrome. So but by definition, this is the optimal correction. Um, so maximum likelihood decoding is not always possible. It cannot always be done in an efficiently. There's like no 
efficient algorithm that works for all quantum error correction codes. Um, but in principle, uh, it's it may be possible to do it. That it, there is yeah, there's always at least a brute force way you can do it by computing coset probabilities. Um, so let me explain how that works. So as I mentioned, to do the decoding, first we measure all of the checks and we obtain a syndrome. Uh, so say we obtain a syndrome S. Um, so so um, it's, I mean, we, we aren't given information about, we don't know what error occurred. We have to try and work that out from the syndrome. Uh, but one thing we can do, we can always calculate efficiently um, some Pali operator F, which anti-commutes um, only with the, the checks that return a minus one outcome and, and no other checks. So this is something we can always compute efficiently. And this Pali operator uh, applied to the code will actually correct the error if that error is in the same coset. Uh, if, if that error is equivalent to F, up to multiplication by a stabilizer. In other words, if the physical error is in the coset FG, where um, G is the stabilizer of the code. So, um, so if we can compute the probability of, of this coset, so the probability that the error we can do maximum likelihood decoding by calculating the coset probabilities of all equivalent inequivalent cosets, and uh, the inequivalent cosets differ just by multiplication by logical non-trivial logical operators. So we can compute if we can compute the probabilities of all of these cosets, and then we just choose the one that has the coset that has the highest probability. So that's the probability the coset where the error is most like the that the error is most likely in and then we can just choose that coset um, and the, that corresponding f as the correction this will this will in principle give you the optimal correction um, so in principle we can always calculate the probability of a coset so it's simply the probabilities the sum of the probabilities of all of the errors in that coset. Um, the problem is that um, to evaluate that sum, you have to sum over an exponential, you have to essentially sum over an exponential number of errors. So the number of um, errors in the stabilizer is, is exponential in the system size. So in general, this is going to be inefficient. However, for these um, types of codes that we're considering, which are 1D log depth circuits, what, what we have is locality. And we can make use of um, the locality properties and the low weight of the checks to obtain a, a, a tensor network description of this summation, um, which can be efficiently evaluated. Uh, for for any coset, um, so I won't. I mean, it's a bit detailed. I won't go into the details about how you can uh, construct these tensor networks, but I'll at least show you what they kind of look like. So actually, we looked at two different ways you can construct these uh, these tensor networks representing cosets. One of them is based on uh, construction by Pravi Suchara Vago, uh, which was used for the surface code. So we can generalize this to arbitrary codes and we get a tensor network that has a structure of the tanograph of the code. And um, you can comp basically for these one de depth circuits, you can compress this, this tanograph into one dimension and um, efficiently evaluate it by multiplying these matrices together. Um, and but we, we found that this was actually quite slow, at least our implementation of it was quite slow. So another, we, we propose an alternative representation of these cosets 
as tensor networks, um, which is based, which looks basically like this. It's like a, a 2D square, oops. The 2D uh, square lattice tensor network um, where all of the uh, tensors have some constant size and the tensors have uh, a, essentially um, binary binary tensors that look like uh, logic circuits. Anyway, I won't go into the details, but suffice to say, um, yeah, both of these descriptions of coset probabilities can be efficiently ca efficiently calculated, contracted um, when we restrict to uh, encoding circuits of depth, um, log depth in, in one dimension. Okay, so any other questions? Um, so there's just one technical point that like, even if we can compute the probability of a coset efficiently, um, there are four to the K inequivalent cosets. Um, and so it seems like, well, we still have to compute an exponential number of, uh, number of things, but actually we overcame this problem by- uh, Sorry. Uh, oh yeah, sure. Can, can we ask a question? Sure, sure. Uh, I think, uh, wait a minute. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I was just wondering that, uh, when you do uh, uh, that, so you have like qubits and then the check, and qubits and check, and then yeah. you will do by uh, a random free vote and the swap gate, right? Uh, and I'm just wondering then, so, uh, so you first apply all this to encode, and then you just wait some time and for the noise to revoke the whole system, and then to do the uh, measurement and to uh, decoding, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay, uh, and another thing is, uh, I, uh, I think, uh, so could you um, explain a little bit more about this process? I'm not really familiar with this. Like I don't know. Uh, so I know you say uh, we measure the check, measure measuring the check qubits, and we got the syndrome. Then how do this uh, uh, how do this be used to to check whether which qubit I have to correct or something like that? I I think I don't quite get that part. Okay, um, so yeah, maybe I can try again. So, um, yeah, basically, yeah, we measure the checks, and all we the only information that we have is a syndrome, right? And um, so it's just some some collection of measurement outcomes. And uh, what we need to do is we need to try and find uh, basically an er a correction. So. So we don't know exactly what the error, what error occurred. We only have this syndrome in, information. So um, what we want to do is we want to try and find the the error, the most likely error you can think about out of that way. Um, but actually, it's not it's not really the most likely error. Um, it's actually the most likely coset of errors because um, if you multiply any error by an element of the stabilizer um, to get a different error, you essentially have exactly the same effect, the same effect on the code. Uh, so, um, because the stabilizers act as the as the identity on the code space, so you have these basically equivalence classes of errors. Um, these are the cosets. And you want to try and find the coset, which is the most likely. Um, does that make more sense? Uh, okay. Uh, and how does this uh, connect to the next slide, like the tensor network one? Like, 
So I have my uh, these syndromes. I can do decision learning in the network. Yeah. So the point is that we can represent the probabilities. So we, we want to try and find the coset, which is the highest probability. Um, and in, I mean, in general, it's very hard to calculate the probability of a coset. Um, you have to do this exponential sum. Okay. Um, but for these types of codes, uh, you can you can decompose this sum into the contraction of a tensor network. Um, so essentially, the tensor network is a, a, an alternative way of representing um, this exponential sum of all elements of the stabilizer group. Um, I could go into more detail about how how exactly you can you can construct the uh, the tensor network for this, but it, I think it, it's a little bit too detailed for for, for this talk. Okay, but if you're uh, interested, I can send some more details. Or there's there's details in the paper. Um, so maybe uh, I want to uh. I, I know like in like uh, in the randomized benchmarking protocol, um, there's like a process tensor and you can use those as uh, seeing it as a tensor network and do some like uh, using tensor network to uh, to do the analysis. And I just wondering, so here you are not, uh, those are not coming from the 30 class and like you do the, uh, 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 do the operations and the measurement to convert that search to the tensional that you are uh, to calculate this probability here and this this probability is obtaining uh, can be represented by the conversion of uh, another tensional um, again. Um, is there some connection? So yeah, so I, I'm actually not not so familiar with that that tensor network description used in randomized benchmarking. So I can't really, so I, sorry, I can't really comment on that. Um, so but, how, yeah. so the data of process here uh, is, can be right now in some contraction of tensor. So you can do the, um, the representing in the loss tensor diagrams. Right. Because some mention of e of f e. I don't know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I mean, it's not just looking at this expression on its own. It's it's not obvious how to turn that into a tensor network. Um, okay. Yeah. So I mean, it, it basically yeah you. Um, Yeah, essentially, I mean, one way you can think about it is that you're summing over, you're doing a, um, so this is the probability of some single error, f times e. And that that is going to be, because we have IID Pali noise, it's like a product of Pali probabilities. And um, so when you do this sum, um, you're doing a sum over a product. And if you look at these expressions for tensor network contraction, you can see that they're all sums over products like this. Now to get all the indices right and stuff, that's that's more complicated. Um, maybe I can't go through that now, but at least you can see that uh, that summation has has the same kind of structure as, as a tensor network contraction. Okay. I think this is enough for me now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. That's where am I? Yeah. So I, I was just saying that there is a, a slight complication in that, that the number of cosets that you, that the number of inequivalent cosets is actually exponential. 
Um, but we can actually overcome this by decoding each qubit one at a time um, and uh, marginalizing over all the other logical qubits. Um, and, and when you do this, only k cosets need to be calculated. And actually, a large amount of the contraction um, can be re reused. Uh, so like decoding a single logical qubit um, isn't actually not so different to, to, um, to decoding all of the qubits. OK. All right. So basically, yeah, the tensor networks give us an efficient way of doing the decoding calculation. So using this, we ran a number of numerical simulations to assess the performance of these codes. Um, so th this is what basically we did in our, in our simulations. Basically, we, we generated a random code with the chosen parameters, um, sampled a Pauli error, assuming IR depolarizing noise of strength P. Um, then based on that error and the code, we can simulate a sim syndrome measurement and given that syndrome run the decoder on the syndrome, which will present a correction. And um, basically, we will get an error if the correction, so a we will get a logical error if the correction supplied by the decoder um, is uh, not, not in the same coset as the physical error, is, is not equivalent up to multiplication by a stabilizer. Um, and uh, yeah, you can, do, you can check this very easily by looking at whether um, uh, yeah, the, the, whether the correction plus the physical error anti-commutes with a logical operator. Um, so we can do this to see if, uh, yeah, we can run this many times looking at whether an error, logical error occurred or not to determine say, failure and su success probabilities, uh, varying different parameters in the simulation, like the noise strength, the rate, um, and other code parameters. OK, so, so here are some basic properties of the code that we found. Uh, firstly, um, in, this, in this first part on the top, top left, top right, uh, we have essentially the failure probability of each encoded logical, op, logical qubit as a function of its position, relative position on the, on the line. So if you remember the way we defined our encoding circuit, we, we put the logical qubits evenly spaced among the, among the check qubits. Um, so, so yeah, we can look at the, the failure um, probabilities of each logical qubit separately and, uh, and yeah, plot it uh, as a function of its position on the line for different sizes. So what we found is that, yeah, so we used open boundary conditions. And so near the boundary, there's some uh, there's some boundary effect, but when you're sufficiently far from the boundary in the bulk region, um, essentially the, the probability of any bulk qubit fa failing appears independent of, of the system size. And we call this failure probability of a qubit in bulk um, P prime L. So another thing we looked at was correlations um, so on this axis here, we have basically the probability that qubit two failed, given qubit one failed, minus the probability that qubit two failed. Uh, so this is like a measure of um, the correlations in the, between the failures between qubit two and one. Like how much more likely is it that qubit two will fail given that qubit one failed as a function of the separation of those logical qubits. Um, and uh, so this is, this is the separation, oh, that should be a lowercase r. So separation divided by the depth times the rate. So distance normalized by um, depth and rate. What we see is that um, these 
curves seem to collapse and we get some uh, short range correlations essentially. So, I mean, we get some decay in correlation. So this is maybe quite unlike a fully random stabilizer code where there's not really any no notion of, of distance of, um, yeah, of, of, yeah. So maybe this is one point which is different to fully random codes. Okay, so another thing that we looked at was threshold. So considering for a given rate, how much uh, noise can, can the code tolerate? Um, so we can compute, uh, so basically we looked at the, this bulk error probability, failure probability, um, as a function of the noise strength and as a function of the depth. So each each curve, each color on this on this plot corresponds to a uh, a different depth. And we've plotted both the as I mentioned, there are two ways we can construct the random encoding: either uniformly choosing them, that's using uniformly choosing the single qubit unitaries, that's the standard uh, way, and also the way that maximizes the check weight, the greedy way. But um, qualitatively, they have the same basic performance um, and well, same basic behavior. Uh, what we observe is that below a so certain crossing point, um, the error rate, the, this failure rate decays um, with, a, with the depth. And um, we, we observe that this appears to be an exponential decay if we plot it on a, um, a log 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 and on a log plot. Um, so what this means, if the if if we have exponential decay of the this bulk logical error rate, this so exponential decay of of a given bulk qubit in D basically implies that um, if we look at the whole code, the probability that at least one qubit will fail um, should, should tend to zero in, as n goes to infinity, as long as the depth is proportional um, to log n for sufficiently, for sufficiently large uh, prefactor. So basically, it seems that below this threshold, um, you can get uh, a logical error rate tending to zero um, for log depth circuits. Um, so what about the location of this, this threshold? Well, so this dotted line here is actually the threshold that you get from the hashing bound. So the hashing bound is what you have when you have a fully random a random stabilizer code. So this is quite interesting. So it seems that like the the um, threshold for these highly restricted codes in in one dimension with only log depth um, log depth encoding circuits appears to be the same as what you get from a fully random um, stabilizer code. Um, so we looked at this for different rates and uh, at least below a rate of about a third, we, oops, we saw that the threshold was quite clear and it corresponded very closely to, the, to this hashing bound. Oh, sorry, wait, yeah, yeah. But for rates high, so for rate half, for instance, it's, oops, sorry about that. It, uh, it appears that, yeah, the, the crossing is much less clear. Um, so this, I mean, this was maybe due to the limitations of our numerics. For higher rates, the computation becomes more expensive, the tensor network becomes bigger, and uh, maybe for these, the depths that we could, we could get to, it, it was not clear where the threshold was, but at least we have observed very, the, the threshold is very close to the hashing bound for rates less than about a third. Okay, 
So just to summarize some of the advantages of the scheme, what, what we've shown is that um, you know, even though it's, it, it has one, even though it has 1D connectivity, um, you can still get a very high rate close to the hashing bound, um, at least for, for some, some noise strength. And uh, we have an efficient decoder using tensor networks. Um, so there are some disadvantages of this scheme. Obvious one is that we have non-constant weight checks. The check weight grows logarithmically with the system size. And we only have uh, a distance scaling at most logarithmic with the system size as well, with, with n. OK, so, um, so in terms of future directions, one thing we could look at is um, how to do, so I mentioned that the encoding, we assume that encoding and decoding were done in noiselessly. Um, the next step would be to see, well, can we tolerate errors in, in these procedures? And also, are there ways of doing um, fault tolerant gates on these encoded logical qubits? Um, are there advantages of doing this in two and higher spatial dimensions? And it's like, and in order to answer these questions, it's likely that we will need to develop more efficient decoding methods. So the methods that we used for decoding were essentially optimal. Maybe we can give up some of that optimality um, in order to uh, consider higher spatial dimensions or um, the situation where we have uh, faulty check measurements or encoding circuits. Okay, so to summarize, so we've studied the performance of these random log depth Clifford encoding circuits for quantum error correction. Um, we've shown that uh, we can efficient we have an efficient decoder for these these types these codes uh, based on tensor networks, and um, using this decoder, we can demonstrate that uh, we can achieve, achieve the same rate, at least numerically, appears to be the same rate as fully random uh, Clifford encodings uh, for, for depolarizing noise of a, variety, of a range of noise strengths. Okay, so thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think up, up here I have uh, one question. So when you say sure. efficient, Decoder, what is the scaling of, of it? Is it uh, yeah, scaling proportional to uh, you have a log n size, uh, uh, a log n depth circuit, right? So how, how does your, uh, when you say efficient, what is the scaling of it? Yeah, yeah. So it depends actually on the, the on the, um, how do I say, the coefficient in front of the log. So if you if you fix d to be alpha log n, uh -huh. um, then you will have the the um, I think the tensor network will run in time something like n to the alpha or something like that. So what is alpha? What does alpha mean in this so, case? It's just the overhead. So the alpha. So the, I mean, what I mean is, uh, let's see. Um, so you can you actually have yeah. some mm -hmm. some freedom in terms of how how you choose alpha, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So like the larger alpha is, the more error suppression you will have. Mm -hmm. um, but the less efficient the decoding will be. So al yeah, alpha is just how how fast um, the depth is scaling with the with the system size. Okay. That's another trade-off uh, is is here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, essentially, it's a it's a parameter that you you might want to vary. So, okay, you uh, you know, you might be trading off between the number of qubits and the the error rate on the qubits. So, by in increasing alpha, you get um, yeah, you get fewer qubits but better error suppression. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, my other question would be, uh, are you, are you guys thinking about like, um, 
uh, using LDPC code in in the studies somehow? Uh, so, yeah, I was actually kind of thinking about if there's some some way in which we can. Uh, um, I don't know. So, I mean, rather than having just like this kind of dumb, random mm -hmm. thing, whether you can do something more clever to get codes with better properties. Okay. Um, I mean, so I know there are a lot, a lot of clever constructions of LDPC codes. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's something, I was want, kind of wondering whether we can somehow enforce good properties on these codes as well as LDPC-ness um, mm -hmm, by, mm -hmm. by constraining the circuit in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, yeah, I, I was, I have been thinking about that, but I, I don't have any solutions. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Yes, we, we have a, we have a study group uh, that uh, we currently studying, uh, like how to turn LDPC code uh, to be uh, to to have locality constraint because even though LDPC has sparse check, mm. right? But then, but still, there uh, the checks are kind of like spread across, like they are spread physically in in the space. So how to yeah. like more efficiently uh, shuffle them so that their locality constraint becomes better? Uh, uh, we I mean we. We have a team currently studying the, this kind of uh, questions. Yeah, I think it's a, a very interesting question. Yeah. So um, yeah. I, mean, I, I, we, I could, I could share with you some, some of maybe the papers that we are studying later on if, to see if you are interested. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. I'd be happy to hear about that. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. I don't have any questions. But, uh, does the audience have any more questions? I think we have one, isn't it? Uh, thank you for the talk. I, I, I would like to understand more about uh, your framework when you talk about one run correction. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if I, I understand correctly. You, you, your apologies to uh, recall or error correction the single qubit one by one. Right? So your one run means one qubit. And uh, so how, how do you choose the random circuit in which you run? You measure and then correct uh, and then apply a random circuit. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, maybe I can elaborate a bit on like where the randomness comes in. But basically, um, yeah, when you're doing the error, basically you sample, you you construct the the error correcting code in a random way, uh, according to this circuit. But then after you've after you've so like, um, you basically choose the parameters in this this circuit at random. Um, but then once you have once you've sampled a particular circuit, then you have a code and you can just use that code as an error correcting code. So from that point on, the code is fixed. Um, so, I mean, the, the randomness comes in, in terms of the, in terms of generating the code, in terms of uh, uh, the, defining the family of codes. But when you're actually doing the error correction, you just have one, fixed code from from this family. Um, does that make sense? So you mean you do random sample and then already fix to do the error correction? Yeah, yeah. So once you've you've defined a code with this random constraint, once you've sampled a code randomly, then um, then in the error correction procedure itself, that code is fixed and you just you just run it like there's there's no more randomness. Uh, so you don't need to do many runs for average. You just uh, continue with this fixed call. This this fixed circuit. Um. So, sorry. Could you repeat that? In, do you need any average? Uh, oh yeah. So if if you want, yeah, that's right. 
so I mean, like if, if you were to do this in practice, you would just sample sample a code at random and you would use that just that code that you've sampled. Um, but in order to evaluate the performance of this like family of codes, then we're, we're randomly choosing many codes from this, um, where we're, we're choosing many codes from this family um, at random. So yeah, so in our simulations, we, we consider many, like every time, every time we ran the simulation, we generated a new code and looked at the error rate, uh, looked at um, and simulated just that code. Um, so yeah, if, if you're, if you want to, if you want to uh, evaluate the performance of like the family of codes, yes, you will have to sample many codes from that family. Um, but if you were to, to run this in practice, you would just choose one code from the family and run, do error correction with that. And if you already fixed one uh, sample of 30, and then how do you guarantee the, I mean, do you have some guarantee of the probability to be accurately uh, error corrected? Um, some guarantee, uh, hmm, may, maybe I don't, I don't quite understand. So could you repeat that? Uh, I mean, uh, because the performance is a base, uh, it's measure on average, but oh, I see. Fact, the, yeah. the already six thirty, and how do you know this, uh, random uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So you're saying if, um, like, is is there some chance that, you know, you might just sample a very bad code? <laughs> um, I guess this, what this shows is that, like, if the average, yeah. So sorry, I'm not not very good at putting these precisely, but um, you know, if if the average uh performance of all of this code family results in a very low error rate um then you know there's a very good chance that when you randomly sample a code from this family that you're going to get a very low error rate um but yeah i don't ha i don't have any uh rigorous uh bounds on that okay, thank you and um, another question is uh uh, if I understand correctly, the tensor network will correct some entanglement. So uh, it, it is good enough for for some low entangle error. So that's why poly noise can work well. So is that the reason that tensor network can? Um, so the thing is that in this case, the tensor network is not actually des describing a quantum state. It's describing uh, kind of a probability distribution or something. So, I mean, in terms of the actual entanglement in the system, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's an obvious, obvious connection. Um, I think the reason why it, it comes, why the, the tensor network is tractable is more from the locality. Um, the fact that you only have uh, checks that act on a on a small number of of qubits. And how how is that related to the distribution dimension? The how is that related to what the distribution? The work and the network is used for some uh, distribution here. Uh, oh yeah. I, I, oh, I more. Yeah yeah. So okay so. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit complicated to explain, but as, as I mentioned, the, I mean, you have this sum over product structure, um, when you're, when you're evaluating this, these cosec probabilities and, uh, each term in that product, um, 
essentially depends on on uh, um, yeah this is it, it depends on the um, the check the number of checks that act on like the number of ind indices on each of the tensors depends on the number of checks that act on a given qubit and so because we have locality we have that, that um, each qubit is not being acted on by so many checks um, and that that allows us to write the to express this as a tensor network efficiently where the tensors have um, a small number of of, it, of entries Uh, so, uh, so, sorry, sorry uh, my final question is uh, uh, about the cosmetic. So, when you random sample, so different uh, different sample will have different cosmetic, is that right? Or, uh, I mean, or chosen in different. So, cosmetic is corresponding to different chosen operators, right? So, it yeah. makes differences. And cosmetic is. Uh, do they have, uh, so it, it refers to this time, this, this time sampling, or it refers to that this is to be? Um, so, so, so could, could you repeat that? The, sorry, the audio was cut off a little bit. Could you? I, I just want to uh, understand uh, what your uh, uh, say related to. Uh, uh, which element? I mean, the is uh, uh, the 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 the, the operator you chosen this time, or is uh, also specific to certain to it? Uh, okay, so uh, maybe okay. So basically, we consider essentially we consider a coset for all of the for any operator that could have given rise to that syndrome. So there's a coset corresponding to each Pali of each inequivalent Pali operator. Um, oh, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Each inequivalent Pali operator um, that could have given rise to the syndrome. And we consider all of them. Uh, it will be a uh, subset when you sample one. Oh, I see. Yeah. So then, okay. So in if you if we were doing it optimally, we would consider all of the um, all of these co every single coset, and there's an exponential number of them. Um, but we make a slight simplification in that um, we look at a single cube, single logical qubit, and we calculate. Um, we we basically put the other logical operators into the stabilizer. So we, we, sum, of, we sum over all of those if, as if they were stabilizers. And we work out um, like the optimal correction for uh, one specific logical qubit at a time. Uh, and then we only have to consider um, k cosets rather than um, some exponential number of cosets, four to the k cosets. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have more questions. Uh, perhaps I have one then. Sure. Uh, it's about the locality. Uh, yeah. First, uh, an important feature for the circuit that you showed, and I was wondering how do you how do you demand this locality to happen? Is it because you're using this I swap gates, and you're going to be like only this two qubit gates, and they're just randomly put in the circuit? Yeah. So I mean, the locality really comes about from the low depth. So. Basically, I mean, when you start off, before you apply the circuit, the, 
the logical qubits are just completely isolated, right? Um, but then each round of I swap gates is going to spread spread them out a little bit. And so if, I mean, if you let the depth go to infinity, that you're going to have something non-local. It's going to be, uh, your information is going to be essentially spread out uniformly on the physical qubits. But we can impose locality essentially by constraining the depth. And so we constrain the depth to just be a log logarithm in the system, logarithmic in the system size. And that's essentially how we get locality. Yeah, and you and you kind of measure that also using the correlation, right? To see how much that's right. Yeah, yeah. So I mean you can kind of see the locality in the code based on the um, correlations between the failures of the logical qubits, um, which is something that you wouldn't see for like a, a, a non-local, like fully random code. I see. So, in in so if I understand the way you're saying, if you have like a fully random code, it is kind of guaranteed it's going to be non-local as well. Like this yeah. two properties. Right, right. Yeah. Right. That, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, one more question. Sure. Just a bit confused. Uh, so, uh, so the the rate is a divided by n, and then uh, in the the setting in the picture, it means it's like one to be and one check and one to be and one check. Uh, but uh, at the end, the R is like um, the at most like one third. Then what is those? Uh, oh. I mean, you need more yes. loss. And where is it? So it's just um, so basically. I, okay, sorry. So I guess you're referring to this picture where you have one yes. qubit, one check. Yeah. So this is where the rate is a half. So if you had a third, then it would be one, two checks, and then one. Sorry, if it, yeah, if it was a third, it would be two checks, one logical, two checks, one logical, like that. Um, Using the swap, because I thought the swap is between one check and one qubit. And oh, so I mean, this this circuit is the same regardless of the rate. Um, uh -huh. It's the the only thing that changes when you change the rate is is um. You know how many check qubits there are relative to logical qubits. Okay. When in in the input. Yeah. Uh, oh. Just, uh, can we uh, affect the depth of the uh, the depth? Because if you have uh, more checks, then you need more swap to. Do something or um, I mean, no. It. I mean, you can use the same. You can use the exact same circuit, and we use the exact same circuit, reg regardless of the of the weight. Thank you. It's a nice talk. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Just waiting for a moment to see anyone else. Something. But meanwhile, yeah, it was a, a very nice talk, very didactic. So, right. And I think we are now going to have any more questions. So I would like to thank you again for accepting. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. And thanks very much for the nice questions, too. Thank you. Okay. Hopefully, I'll have a chance to visit um, someday in the near future. Yes, you are. You are mostly welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye.